sure if you know about this, but a dragon is a significant symbol in Eastern mythology, and that is especially so in China and Japan. I grew up watching the cartoon series called Dragon Ball Z when I was in primary school, and it's a famous cartoon series first released in Japan in 1989, and if you have ever watched it or read it, you will know that dragons play important roles there as powerful creatures that fulfill human wishes. Uh, I think the main, main character is named Goku in English, and there are several dragons that he summons to fight against the wicked and to save the world, and that series has been very popular in Japan and Korea, and it's a great example of the many ways in which dragons feature in Asian mythology. And in Chinese mythology, uh, dragons were often seen as something like semi-divine creatures, and they have long been associated with the office of an emperor who was believed to have descended from those creatures. Uh, dragons were looked upon as beings with great power, and they would use their strength and forces to control the weather and to bring fortunes to their loyal servants. And they are so deeply embedded in Chinese culture that even today they appear in Chinese New Year festivals and symbolize good blessings with their presence. And what's interesting for us to notice today is that the image of dragons or something similar to that also appears in the Bible. Uh, they are mentioned several times in the Holy Scriptures, and when they do appear, they are often used as symbols of chaos, as symbols of destruction, and symbols of the devil and his wickedness. They do not have positive images like they do in East Asian cultures. And unlike those stories, a biblical dragon does not help humans, but attacks them, devours them, and destroys them as one opposed to God. So in the book of Genesis, for example, the serpent in the garden is a smaller version of a dragon, we might say. And in the book of Job, moreover, we read about a creature that is named Leviathan, and it's a representation of chaos and ferocity and fiery breath, and all of those details resemble Satan and all his works. And in Psalm 74, which we'll read towards the end of today's sermon, Leviathan appears once again as a term for the devil. And in the book of Isaiah, the prophet speaks of a future when God will defeat that draconic creature. And as we read before, the book of Revelation also speaks of a dragon who stood, uh, sorry, who stood as an enemy of our God. So a dragon is not just an ancient mythical figure, but also it's a, a biblical figure. And God's people for a long time have understood Satan by means of that draconic image. And you might be wondering at this point as you're hearing this, why do we have to begin with this information today when we are concluding our series on Exodus? Like, why do we have to start with these facts or myths or stories involving a dragon? And I cover these stories today because in the Holy Bible, the Pharaoh of Egypt is compared to a dragon or a sea monster that threatens the people of Israel. And God in the Holy Scriptures is depicted as a warrior who slays the dragon and saves his people. Uh, just like there were little messianic figures before the coming of Christ, there were also little satanic figures that also appear in the Old Testament. And Pharaoh, as we will see, was that small and shadowy but significant symbol of Satan and the devil and all that wickedness that Satan represented. And I know I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but... Uh, if you open your Bibles and turn with me to Ezekiel 29, I believe that if you're using our Pew Bibles, it's on page 757. I just vaguely recall that page number. We're not going to spend much time there at the moment, so you might as well just listen to me say and read and explain the passage. But if you go to that passage, Ezekiel 29, and read it on your own, you will notice that Pharaoh is described there as a great monster, or even a great dragon, if you're using from the ESV translation. 
And I think that passage is a good starting point for us to begin thinking about how the Bible expects us to see Pharaoh. And here we'll also learn to see how God works against him, which is an important part of the story that we read about in the whole Exodus narrative. And so we can go to verses 3 to 6, just a few verses, Ezekiel 29. And let's briefly think about, as we read this, let's briefly think about how Pharaoh is described there and how our God responds to that person. Sorry, and by the way, this was a prophecy given during Israel's Babylonian exile, and so we're looking at a period that's much later than the time of Moses, and so we're looking at the same office, but different individuals when it mentions the name Pharaoh. So verse 3 to 6, and I'll read from the ESV. God says, Behold, I'm against you, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon that lies in the midst of his streams that says, My Nile is my own. I made it for myself. So here God fights against Pharaoh because Pharaoh is acting like a creator. I made Nile for myself. I am like the creator. And God is pointing that out. Verse 4, I'll put hooks in your jaws. This is God saying, I'll put hooks in your jaws and make the fish of your streams stick to your scales. And I'll draw you up out of the midst of your streams with all the fish of your streams that stick to your scales. So you notice there, Pharaoh is described like a sea monster with all the fish in his streams sticking around his scales. Verse 5, I will cast you out into the wilderness, you and all the fish of your streams. You shall fall on the open field and not be brought together or gathered. To the beasts of the earth and to the birds of the heavens I gave you, I give you as food, that all the inhabitants of Egypt shall know that I am the Lord. So the first thing I want to say today, by borrowing Ezekiel's insight into the relationship between God and Pharaoh, is that our God fights the dragon or the sea monster or Pharaoh to take his people onto the promised land. The spiritual battle that God fights for us in and through our Lord Christ Jesus is ultimately to deliver us from the powers of this world onto the powers of the new world, and that deliverance from earth to heaven is what God foreshadowed in the event of Exodus and perfected through the ministry of Christ. What God does through Exodus is fulfilled, let's say, in the book of Revelation, and that transference from the world of the dragon to the world of Christ is what Exodus is ultimately, I mean ultimately, about. And so, to think a bit deeper about how God is so very different from the Pharaoh of Egypt, you can go back to the first two verses in the opening chapter of Genesis, and you will see there that there's a clear reference to water, right? The Spirit of God hovering over the waters, and you will notice that that very water was something that had to be governed or ordered or arranged by God prior to the fall. From the very beginning of the biblical teaching, we see that water was connected with formlessness and emptiness. And it is not that God made water evil from the beginning, but it means that it lacked order and pattern that it later came to have in the following passages in chapter 1 and chapter 2. And what's also interesting for us is that the creation story there does not only tell us about the governors of waters, but also the emergence of a dry land. Uh, And if you read verse 9 in chapter 1, you will notice it's pairing. Uh, So verse 9 says, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And if we move to the story of Noah's ark and the great flood that happens in Genesis 6 and following, you will also notice water and land shaping the thrust of the story. 
And now as we move to Exodus 14, we once again read about the waters being governed and the dry land emerging. And all of those words are there to remind us of the great power that our God possesses over the entire creation. A pharaoh boasted in his ability to make one river for himself and claimed his greatness even before our God. But his power is nothing. It is absolutely nothing compared to the great power that God showed as our Creator, as our Redeemer, and as Israel's own Father. So in Exodus 14, the Israelites find themselves trapped between the Egyptian army and the barrier of the Red Sea. And God intervenes through Moses, parting the waters with wind and allowing the dry land to appear. And he enables his people to walk on that and move toward the promised land by the help of God and for his glorious name. In the face of imminent danger, fear grips the hearts of the people who were once slaves in the land of Egypt. And it led, led them to lament their state and question Moses' leadership. And they said, well, it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians, let's say little dragons in Egypt, than that we should die in the wilderness. It would have been better for us to die in Egypt than we should die in the wilderness. And in that context, Moses tells them to trust in God's great deliverance and he tells them to stand firm and witness and behold and see the work of God that will unfold before their eyes. Moses said, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. And isn't it so great? God will accomplish this work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you shall, you shall see, you shall see them again no more. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. And I think this is so great. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. Moses' words here echo through the ages as a timeless reminder of God's loving and caring heart. And whether it's the people under Moses or all of us in Christ Jesus, the truth remains unmoved that our God fights for us and we shall hold our peace. Our God fights for you and you shall hold your peace. So the parting of the waters and the appearance of the dry land have their echoes even in the early chapters of Genesis. And Exodus has revealed some of those truths to confirm the point that our God indeed is the creator. To counter the fake creation work that Pharaoh boasted before the eyes of the world, our God showed greater things to display his amazing power in, over the entire creation. And the Bible so highlights that power that in Revelation 21, there's a verse that says that there's no more sea in the new world. There is no more sea monster, therefore, in the new creation. And instead of a new land emerging from the bottom up, God sends the heavenly Jerusalem from top down. And isn't that amazing? Our God sends the promised land not from the bottom up, but from top down. So the Bible is clear that when God saves his people, he conquers the forces of Satan and provides for us a holy land to live in. And when God fights the dragon and the armies of Satan, he doesn't leave the people whom he saved. You know the Superman and Batman, the superheroes? They fight against the devil, the wicked characters, and save the people. But what do they do in the end? They leave behind the people they saved. But our God fights the dragon, and he takes his people, and he lives with them. It is glorious place, which we call the kingdom of God. There is only one God who can claim complete ownership of the entire world, and that is not Pharaoh, that is not Satan, and that is not the dragon, but it is our God who conquered evil, and that is what salvation is ultimately about. Our God slays the dragon, 
in order to lead us forward. And if you allow me to press on and move on to the second point of the sermon, I want to notice with you also that when the Bible speaks of God transferring his people onto the new and the heavenly Jerusalem, it doesn't just speak about it in terms of uh, moving from the old world or to the new world or from the present to the future, but it speaks of it in terms of also for, uh, moving from the underworld onto the upper world. The Bible describes God's saving work not just in terms of moving you from the present toward the future, but it also speaks of it in terms of moving you from the bottom up. And for one thing, Egypt was known as a dark place that had many experts in the death rituals. And I'm sure most of you would know that the Egyptians were skilled in the practice of mummification and other practices like magic and chanting for the people who died. And when the Israelites cried out to Moses, have you brought us to the wilderness to make us die? Part of that meaning is, well, we can get all these better and great death rituals or burial systems that we can get in Egypt, and you brought us here and make us die, and we have to miss all of that. That's partly uh, what's there in their uh, grumbling. Uh, when the Jews or the Israelites uh, complain against Moses. And so it is not so surprising that the Bible acknowledges Egypt as a place associated with death. And that's why Egypt was often described as Sheol in the Bible or the underworld or even something like hell. And that perception is reflected even in Genesis in literary ways. Uh, you will see in Genesis, for instance, Going toward Egypt is often portrayed as going down. And that is a literary way to symbolize the position of Egypt in the broader story of Israel. Genesis doesn't just speak about Egypt in terms of a different place, but in terms of an underworld. And the Bible is subtle in giving us that information. So, for, for instance... When Joseph was being sold as a slave in Genesis 37, we read that the Ishmaelites were going down to Egypt, right? Going down to Egypt. And also in Genesis 46, God spoke to Jacob, I am God, the God of your father. Do not fear to go down to Egypt. For I'll make you of a great nation there. I'll go down with you to Egypt, and I'll bring you back again. And Joseph will put his hand on his eyes. There's an expression of going down and coming up. And I would say that the death and resurrection of Christ are foreshadowed therein. And just to help you grasp that this wasn't merely about a geographical issue, like going down geographically, you can also read a passage like Ezekiel 31 and find there that Egypt is compared to a great tree that has been cut down and thrown into a place called Sheol. And that downfall, and not just removal, but downfall into Sheol was caused by the pride of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, who stood against God. Egypt in the Bible was a symbol of sin and death and the underworld. And what God did for Israel was to move them up from there and place them somewhere higher. And that higher place ultimately, again, is the kingdom of God, which we call heaven or the new creation. God doesn't merely move Israel to a different place, but he moves them up from a place of darkness. And that is a biblical way to portray God's saving work and also to capture this heavenward direction of God's grace, this upward direction of God's work. So one important takeaway from this is that we should recognize God's saving work as something like a vertical movement from darkness to light, from grave to life, and from hell to heaven. Just as Egypt faced downfall due to its pride and arrogance, humanity as a whole faced the judgment of God for their pride and idolatry. 
We have all fallen short of the glory of God, and we all deserve to be thrown down into the depths of the underworld. And we all deserve to be cut down and cast into Sheol, for we are sinners, and we have sinned against our God. We deserve a life in that dark world, and that's where we belong. But that's where God saves us from, and that's why Jesus came. Our God, being so merciful, offers redemption to those who turn to him in faith. Through the gospel of the Lord Jesus, we can experience the work of God that lifts us upward from the world of death. And as God comes to us, he leads us not only toward the future, but he also moves us upward toward that upper world, our eternal home to which we belong even now through faith. That is the new Jerusalem. Just like the Israelites were delivered from the world of Egypt, so too can we find liberation from whatever pit that we are in through the grace of Christ Jesus. Whether it be your sin, your distress, or your hopelessness, God takes you upward from the gripping powers of Satan and God lifts you and pulls you up even now through the Spirit that you may enjoy heavenly life even now as you wait for its full coming. God is pulling you up through grace, and that is what God is doing for you at the moment. He is pulling you up from the pit that you are in, and that's part of the work that God does for you. And so perhaps now is a good time to move to Psalm 74 uh, as we end today. And this is a great passage that encapsulates some of the points that I wanted to communicate this morning. And I hope this will help you appreciate God's victory over Pharaoh and his work for you as well. So Psalm 74 is a lament that expresses the distress of the psalmist. And it reflects his prayer for God's intervention. And so this is great passage telling us about God's great battle against the dragon. And no doubt it shows us about God's caring love for his people. And I'll read from verse 12 to 21. God is my king of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. You divided the sea by your strength. You broke the heads of the sea serpents in the waters. You broke the heads of Leviathan in pieces and gave him as food to the people inhabiting the wilderness. And so this is language that's coming from Ezekiel, right? You broke the heads of Leviathan in pieces and you gave him as food to the people inhabiting the wilderness. Verse 15, you broke open the fountain and the flood. You dried up mighty rivers. The day is yours, the night also is yours. You have prepared the light and the sun. You have set all the borders of the earth. You have made summer and winter. And notice all this creation language there. God defeats the dragon because he's the creator. Verse 18, remember this, that the enemy has reproached, O Lord, that a foolish people has blasphemed your name. Do not forget the life of your poor forever. Have respect to the covenant, for the dark places of the earth are full of the haunts of cruelty. Oh, do not let the oppressed return ashamed, and let the poor and needy praise your name. So the bottom line is this, and this is what I want to conclude today as we summarize or conclude our Exodus series. What God has done through Moses, God has done it better through Christ. And what God has revealed through Moses, he revealed it better through Christ. We have the privilege of this greater revelation that's recorded for us in this Holy New Testament. And we are encouraged to see and, and behold and marvel at the saving work that culminates in Christ Jesus. The Bible talks about God's saving work, not primarily in terms of what God has done through Moses for Israel, but what Jesus has done for the church of Christ. And so receive Jesus today and serve him with your might. And as God fights for you, fight the good fight for your soul as well.
Uh, you might be battling with all these different desires inside of you, the lust of the flesh or the pride of life, or you might be having all these legal problems or relational problems that you need to tackle as a faithful Christian. Fight the good fight and do not succumb to the devil, devil, trusting that God fights for you or God has already fought for you through Christ Jesus, your eternal king. Remember that the God of Israel is yours and the God of Exodus is yours. And what God did for Israel, he will also do it for you. Let's pray. Our gracious Father, we thank you and we worship you for your mighty work of salvation that is performed through your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that we are able to spend the past five or more weeks to think a bit deeper about the implications of the great Exodus event that we first find in Genesis and culminates in the story of Christ in Revelation. And we thank you that through this, we were able to think a bit deeper about your grace. We pray that you would continue to lift us up from the pit that we are in in the present moment. And please uplift us, encourage us, and establish us as we continue to walk toward our heavenly home. Bless us and encourage us and protect us through, throughout the day. And we give this prayer in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.